not watch this video unless you have ridiculous amounts of time on your hand to watch a random human being ramble incoherent thoughts about a psychological thriller by Naoki Urasawa known as Monster. Oh. As you may have guessed it, we have bought the entire series of Monster. Was browsing a little and saw that they had volumes one through nine of Monster. What better time to buy the entire series than when I get half of them half off? Yeah, that sounds about right. So here they are in all their glory. Nine volumes, Naoki Urasawa's Monster. I've never read this series and I only know three things about the series. One is that everybody who reads manga loves this series. Two, it's made by Urasawa. He is a great mangaka and has a lot of good titles. And three, all nine volumes make a really cool picture. And that is it. I know nothing else about this story, so I will be giving you my raw, honest opinion of Monster the series. We're gonna read all nine volumes, hopefully today. I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but I'm gonna try my best. I do have a class later. So I'm gonna dive into it with no expectations. And let me know in the comments down below if I miss any thematic elements, if I interpreted something differently the way I read it than you did. I'm always open to hearing your guys' thoughts and opinions on series that I read because odds are I'm gonna miss things. I'm not gonna 100% grasp everything in the story and it's great to see other people's perspectives. So yeah, we've got the big boy stack of monster. We've got the big boy stack of monster and we're just gonna get to it. I also picked up Fire Punch volume three for anybody that cares, a little Tatsuki Fujimoto. All right, so volume one, here we go. Monster, first thoughts, first impressions, first read, first everything, let's do it. First impression from reading about like the first 15 or so pages is we have the main character, Dr. Kenzo Tenma, I think his name is, Dr. Tenma. And he is an excellent surgeon. He just saved a famous opera singer from a really bad aneurysm. It seems as though there's gonna be a lot of problems intertwining with the story already. The head of his team, Dr. Heinemann, I believe, is the father of the daughter that he is currently seeing. So I can see a lot of things happening there. And the daughter has already mentioned that her dad is set to become a chairman at the hospital, which will then put Kenzo in a position to be the head of the department that he is currently working in. And there's already other doctors that can see what's going on they kind of think that Kenzo is playing favorites and using Dr. Heinemann's daughter to gain more power within the hospital and move up the ladder and on top of it Kenzo was also writing Dr. Heinemann's papers to be published which I think if I'm not mistaken is a thing that happens a lot within the medical community I can see a lot of bad things already happening within this story I'm not sure if it's supposed to be like dark a drama a thriller it kind of seems that way and I didn't realize that it was in a hospital setting I'm pretty terrible with hospitals diseases surgeries, all of that stuff. So I'm not sure if I will even make it through this manga, but I'm going to try my best. So we've already got a pretty depressing scene within like the first 30 pages of this. My gosh, basically Dr. Tenma was called in in the middle of the night to perform surgery on a Turkish construction laborer. And he was there first in the hospital, but they made him wait because the famous opera singer had priority technically over the construction labor. I mean, obviously it was just all politics behind the scenes. And it's just really sad because the wife confronts him of the guy who passed away because he was there first, he was waiting, he needed the operation and had to wait hours until they performed on this opera singer. It was more of a media story. It would get more coverage. Nobody really cares about the lower class apparently in the story either. So pretty sad. I mean, the story set in 1986 Germany. I'm not sure of the economic situation back then, but there's still some resonance from this little part in today's society anyways. All right, I guess this is gonna be a pretty dark story. I gotta strap in. I keep pausing reading because so much is already happening in the story. I don't understand what's gonna happen through the next eight and a half volumes, but the girl he's dating literally says some lives are worth more than others. And we can already see where she's coming from. She's clearly upper class. She's been spoon fed her whole life. She has no struggles. And she literally just didn't care about this person that passed away while that man's child and wife were crying and pleading to the doctor to give them her husband back. I could see Kenzo possibly having like a mental breakdown. There's just a lot of pressure on him from the political side of the hospital to Kenzo himself dealing with inner struggle, thinking that he let this man die. This is a lot. This is pretty heavy for an introduction to these characters. All right. So chapter one ends with a literal bang. The German trade advisor who was visiting gets murdered along with his wife. The boy was shot in the head and is still has a pulse so we'll see i'm assuming that dr ten was going to try and save him the daughter was left living so we're assuming that this was a break-in a robbery chapter one is jam 
jam-packed with a lot. It is pretty dense and it's more on like the psychological side than anything I feel. Yeah, so I can see so much going wrong already. Kenzo's fiance's dad, Dr. Hyman, I'm pretty sure his name is. I could be getting it wrong this whole time. I'm sorry if I am. Apparently he has asked Kenzo who is almost done with his medical research on cerebral vasospasm in models of subarachnoid hemorrhaging. <laughs> he has asked him to completely cancel that research and write a manuscript for an upcoming conference about emergency medical care, present and future, which is funny because he goes on to say how as the medical leaders of Germany, we have to keep sight of the big picture, which is funny because he is looking pretty small and he literally says they think medicine is some sort of philanthropy. Our primary calling is to advance medical research, not to save lives. This is where I can see the story getting very interesting. And honestly, it's an issue in today's society as well, where a lot of people get into medicine trying to advance and help people and there's a lot of drawbacks and corporatized rules and things in place to kind of prevent some ways that people think that they can help so far this father seems pretty sadistic honestly the whole family does the daughter is clearly super privileged agrees with everything the dad says kenzo moved to germany because he admired this director and now is seeing the evil side of him left his family left his dad's small practice in japan things are starting to snowball very rapidly this this manga is already stressing me out another situation where the director calls Tenma at the hospital right before he's about to operate on the advisor's son who has a bullet lodged in his brain says nope you're scrapping the surgery you're not doing it you're going to be performing surgery on the mayor who just had cerebral thrombus so the director calls in says no matter what you are doing that operation because the mayor has promised a lot of medical subsidies to the hospital that they're working at. So it's all political. It's so beyond aggravating to see this happen so many times. I'm only 48 pages in. There's already been two instances where somebody is going to lose a life just for pure profit. I don't like the director at all. I really don't. <laughs> Let me give a quick clap to Dr. Tenma right there for sticking to his morals and going back and deciding to perform surgery on the child who was there first and who might pass away if he does not perform that surgery right away. Only issue I can see arising from this is one, he is marrying the director's daughter, Ava. So that's gonna cause a little, a little bit of tension, just a tiny bit. Two, if the child dies and the mayor dies, that is so bad. Also, the daughter is going through some sort of like psychosis, just saying the word kill over over and over again so who knows what's going on with her the third option is the child can survive but because Tenma decided to operate on the child and not the mayor the mayor might pass away so yeah I honestly don't see any good coming from this situation aside from just personal gratification from Tenma doing the right thing. It honestly is the right thing, but it's not going to be the right thing for the repercussions that are going to happen to him, I'm assuming. Yep, I called it. The mayor died because Tenma was operating on the child and he is the best surgeon in the hospital. Poor Tenma. He's just trying to do the right thing. That's all he's trying to do and he's getting punished for it. Wow, things have already come crashing down for Dr. Tenma here after choosing to operate on the boy and leaving the mayor to pass away in the hands of other surgeons. The director has literally now appointed a new chief neurosurgeon, says he's never going to move up in the ranks. He's not going to get any recommendations. His career is effectively finished and ruined, which is terrible because it's literally just all politically motivated on the back end and he didn't do something to appease a bad person. So now his career is ruined just for doing the right thing. That is incredibly beyond frustrating. I feel so bad for Tenma. And, and just to top it all off, Ava, his fiance, drops the ring in front of him, calls him a fool, and starts flirting with someone else right in front of his face. So Tenma's got it pretty rough right now. He's got it pretty rough, but it looks like the boy has survived. He opened up his eyes at the end of chapter three. The daughter is still just chanting kill and wandering through the hall. So I'm a little bit concerned about her still. Okay, major plot twist. I'm not sure if Dr. Tenma has superpowers or if God is just willing him on, but he wished that all of these terrible people that were in the hospital hospital business, not to save lives, but just for profit and image, have all been found dead. Einemann, the director of the hospital, who is in position to become the chairman, Dr. Boyer, who replaced Tenma and was put in care of the child and failed the mayor's surgery.
surgery has now been found dead. Also, the director of the surgery unit has been found dead. Clearly, there's going to be a little bit of bias towards Dr. Tenma. I'm pretty sure he's going to be the prime suspect. They're at the funeral, and turns out the children are missing, both of the twins, the boy who just recovered and the daughter who kept chanting kill. It seems as though those three were poisoned by nitric acid, which is a muscle relaxant and candy that they ingested. But the thing of it is, I'm pretty sure if I go back, that they were eating gifts that were sent to the hospital for the twins. So it could have been that somebody was sending gifts to the hospital to poison the twins because they're defectors from East Germany. So I guess this is a time where East and West Germany were still a thing. So just when Kenzo has finally reaffirmed the meaning of doing surgery and helping people out, his whole job is to save lives. He got caught up in some of the political BS that came with it. He has now been offered the job of chief of surgery by the chairman who is not being replaced because Dr. Einemann has passed away, so he has now been pulled back into the landscape, the political side of the hospital once again. So we'll see what happens, but honestly, the funniest part was Ava crawling back to Tenma to try and get back with them because she is now screwed. So she tries to get back with Tenma, and my boy Tenma just leaves, which is hilarious to me. I can't believe it's only chapter six and so much has happened. It feels like I have read an entire story already. And quite honestly, I can see this video being super, super long, so get some snacks, some popcorn, some drinks if you plan on watching the entire thing. So this chapter, nine years have passed. Dr. Tenma is still the head of the department. After he was going to move back to Japan because he was just kind of tired of this life, a lot of people begged and pleaded for him to stay at the hospital because he does such a wonderful job. The patients, the nurses, everybody in between. And it seems as though the people from the BKA are still investigating the case of the unsolved murders from nine years ago at the hospital. And one of them says that he has never had a case go unsolved. This guy is never going to give up. It could be 50 years from now, he's still going to be working on that case. A little bit worrisome for Dr. Tenma, but one of the perpetrators that they wanted to question was running away from something in the middle of the night and got hit by a car. Call Tenma to operate on him. They save his life. First thing he says is he's coming and Tenma questions what it is that he's alluding to and all he says is the monster so i don't know if this is more of a metaphorical thing if there's an actual monster human being whatever the case may be but it seems that there is something out there in the world that is trying to make this case completely unsolvable Dude, no freaking way is the monster johan that dr tenma saved nine years ago that is messed up. That is so messed up on so many levels. You get this epic scene where Junkers or Yunkers confesses to Tenma how he started lock picking as a young child because he wanted this cuckoo clock. Tenma goes out on a date, stops by, sees a cuckoo clock, goes to give it to him in this nice heartwarming moment. We see the guard dead. We see Junkers running away into the fields. Tenma chases him only to find out that the monster is Johan and Johan killed the three back in the day because that is what Tenma wished. Tenma said, I wish they were dead, just as Johan was waking up. So Johan said, hey, I got you. You saved my life. I'm going to help you out in a small way. It's kind of crazy, though, to think that saving one person's life can be the result of so much harm or vice versa. Saving one person's life can be the result of so much good. But in this case, it is it is not good. It is not good so far. But I can see how this can be just a complete and utter destruction of Tenma's mind. This kid was the reason that Tenma decided to take the path of righteousness, to do the right thing, to be a doctor, to save lives, not to go through all the bureaucracy on the back end. And this kid that he saves that changed his life for the better is now taking lives for the worse. That's pretty nuts. Pretty nuts. Good job, Arasawa. The one thing that I am confused about is Johan Liber, who is the kid that Tenma saved, is basically admitting that he was behind killing all of these four families, including his own, and also took a bullet to the head, and he's the monster that everybody is afraid of. That part is a little bit confusing because I'm pretty sure that his family wasn't the first murder, and even if they were, why would he take a bullet to the head to plan out all of this alive? elaborate scheme. It seems a little bit fishy. I can't fully grasp it yet. All right, we've switched focus to a new character, Nina Fortner. 
who is living in Japan and is in college right now and is really, really good at criminal investigation, essentially. I'm assuming her class is like criminal justice sort of style. And she's really good at solving cases in class, keeping herself extremely busy. She sees her therapist where she has reoccurring dreams of a monster emerging from darkness. And my guess is Nina is the twin girl from the incidents where Dr. Tenmo was involved with Johan as well. Nina seems very smart. She wants to be a federal prosecutioner, which makes sense if she is the girl where her parents were murdered. Of course, she's going to want to lock up bad guys. Oof, things are heating up. And Nina receives an email saying, I will come for you soon. So I don't know if it's going to be Johan or whatever his name truly is, or maybe it's going to be Kenzo, Dr. Tenma coming to try and find Nina to question her. It seems like he's getting wrapped up in this case as well. He really got psychologically messed up from Johan becoming a murderer. He essentially created the monster effectively by letting him live and saving his life. And Nina, which is pretty interesting as well, cannot remember her childhood for the life of her. She says she can't remember anything from before the age of 10, which I know is actually a pretty common thing when traumatic events happen in a child's life, they tend to block out those images of what actually happened. So it's very interesting. The amount of work that Urusawa puts in the medical side of the storytelling, not just the overall storytelling, is insane. It's absolutely insane. He is incredible at what he does. So as Tenma is investigating Johan and all of these other names that he goes by, Michael, I think, and now Franz, he comes across an old man who was blind and listened to Franz talk and kind of opened up to him and Franz loved to hear about this man's World War II escapade and he said what amused him the most out of these stories was not the adventure, it was the terror that amused him. Clearly he had a very sadistic side and that was from the age of 12. 12. And not only that, he was a rapid learner. He was learning two different languages at once that were not his native language. This kid is very, very smart. He is now super sadistic. And now he said he is returning to Nina for her 20th birthday, which I'm pretty sure is right around the corner. Otherwise, they wouldn't have introduced Nina at this time. So Nina sees Johan lurking in the back when her friends set her up with who they think is emailing her, but it's not, it's not Johan. She sees him and she faints, just like she did in the hospital when she was younger. So clearly the traumatic incident is, still affects her to this day. I, honestly, I really don't know what's gonna happen from here. It seems like Nina's gonna have to deal with a lot soon because Johan said he's gonna meet her on her 20th birthday and her foster parents are saying that they're going to tell her that they're not her real parents. So she's going to be hit with a lot of traumatic experiences all at once. Nina, Nina, why? She gets another email saying that I'll be waiting for you on your birthday tomorrow evening at seven o'clock at Heidelberg Castle. So Johan is waiting for her. Of course, she's curious. I don't know why. Why do people feel the need to go to these things, especially alone? Why alone? I think the way the emails were framed she thinks it's like a love thing, but he also says he's going to be burying her with flowers, which is also a funeral thing. So I don't know if he's planning on killing Nina or what. Meanwhile, we have Tenma drowning himself in all of the newspaper archives, just trying to figure out where Nina is, who she lives with, a case of a missing person for when Johan ran off in this town. That's his theory. He finds it. But honestly, I think it's a little bit too late because Nina's already headed off to the castle. Uh, so Johan was living with these people people and then ran away and now he's going alone to Heidelberg Castle to try and rescue Nina. Why alone? Why do people always go alone? It never works out. But everybody keeps saying that Johan is pure evil, that the killings were the work of the devil, that it is the most crazy thing that anybody has seen. So in this kid at a young age was just filled with pure evil, which is terrifying to think about because as he grows, I'm sure it only grows with him. Dude, oh my gosh, this is like the ultimate game of cat and mouse. As Ted Tenma leaves the house where Nina is living, or I guess her name was Anna. The phone lines have been cut so they can't call the cops. Tenma has left the house to go rescue Anna, gets attacked by somebody that Johan was paying to be there. He's just been paying all of these pawns to do all of these sadistic things for him. Tenma goes to save Nina. Nina saves him because of her unrelenting passion for Aikido, Japanese martial arts. And now they're going back to the house. Honestly, it could be too late. It could have been too late for Nina. Now it could be too late for her parents. I relax for two seconds. 
something else is happening. Right? Dude, <laughs> what is happening? So of course, Nina's parents have died, oh, along with the journalist that was helping out Tenma, which honestly was a pretty sad scene when Tenma was trying to put the cigarette back in his mouth. Oh my gosh, it was so depressing. We find out, it all makes sense now. It all makes sense. I was questioning why Jonah had a bullet in his head and Anna slash Nina kept saying kill, kill when she was younger. She tried to kill Jonah and freaking Tenma tries to do the right thing and brings him back to life. It's a vicious circle. It's a vicious circle. And now they're with these two random people that are calling themselves cops. Just let me breathe for a second. <laughs> Tell me how we're going to have eight more volumes of this story. It seems like it's already coming to a conclusion in a way. So Tenma and Nina go with these people that claim that they're cops because they got a call to the crime scene. They're covered in blood. They seem mysterious. They're not even from the Heidelberg police station. They're from Mannheim, which is a different town. Driving away, they get, they get pulled over on a stop and that guy recognizes them as officers, but they slip up and say Tenma's name, even though he never told them his name. What is going on? Does Jonah have these people in his pocket? How does he have these people in his pocket? I don't even understand the complexities behind this plan that Jonah has. It really is pure evil. So Nina leaves Kenzo again and says just to go and live his normal life. He has no idea where she has gone, assuming that she's going after her brother once again. Kenzo goes back and just starts working at the hospital again, saving people's lives, you know, just the normal, usual day for Kenzo Tenma until one day Ava comes crawling back to him yet again, realizing that he has loved her all this time because he never wanted her money. He was just a good person. One of the investigators from the BKA came to her house inquiring about a tie, which was Kenzo's, and she protected him. And then since Kenzo decides not to get back with her, she instantly outs him. What a great person that she is. So he's on the run for murder. He quits his job. Although he's on the run for murder, I don't necessarily think that's his first concern. He's He's really just leaving his entire life and making this his life's mission to kill Jonah and get rid of the monster that he effectively created. All of the people at the hospital were protecting Kenzo from the cops saying that he's not a murderer. We owe him our lives. He saved us countless times and he saved so many people's lives, including Jonah's. But this one person, he can't let go from his mind because they're committing evil. But it's just very interesting to see how he can save so many lives and do so much good, but that one bad thing will haunt him for the rest of his life. Okay, so volume one finishes with Kenzo going on his full shonen main character protagonist arc training session with a mercenary to learn how to get in shape, have technique, and to shoot a gun so he can take out Johan the monster. And there was a really sweet endearing moment with the girl from Myanmar who the mercenary took in and she has never smiled once in her entire life since taking her in. Kenzo's food and experience with her has made her smile which brought the old man to tears so it was a very touching moment to end the story but also we now know that Kenzo is fully committed so since a volume one is finished I guess we're gonna go ahead and start volume two that was actually pretty long I don't know if I can even finish all nine volumes in one day but we're gonna give it a shot I was about to start volume two, but I totally spaced out and forgot I have class in like one minute so we're gonna put a break on this and then I'll get back to it so the first chapter in volume two starting off pretty interesting. Tenma meets a guy named Otto Heckel as he is casing out the last murder site where Johan, Franz, whatever you want to call him at this point, he has so many different aliases. Otto Heckel to me is a little bit annoying. He's not my favorite character. Like I probably had no criticisms of the first volume. I'm only like 20 pages in. This character is like my least liked character by far. <laughs> Maybe he'll redeem himself in the future. I'm not sure. It seems as though Johan is one step ahead of Tenma. In all cases, he left a message for him back at the mansion. When Tenma spoke to somebody that Heckel supposedly saw Johan with, he left him a message. So Johan is like a year in the future, pretty much, of what Tenma is trying to achieve by catching him. And it seems as though Johan's satisfaction for doing these terrible things and committing these heinous acts of crime is only growing more inside of him. Seems like he's just enjoying it more and more as time goes on. Honestly, if Tenma is going to be this vigilant Lanty, Liam Neeson type human being. He needs to catch Johan pretty quick. The next chapter ends with a pretty interesting interaction between Tenma and two terrorists. They did it with intent to protect themselves because their people were getting run off as East and West Germany finally combined. They were losing business. They were losing their jobs. So they had their own motives. But the entire time Tenma refused to treat this man. His whole objective was to get accidentally hired as a black market 
surgeon and treat this man and he refused refused even with the gun in his face and then finally treated him interesting to see tenma keep his hippocratic oath to help anyone in need even though he is a complete vigilante at this point it's a weird dynamic between tenma and himself on tenma's little adventure here he comes across the burned down orphanage and speaks to somebody who used to work there who seems like a really nice guy to be honest he invites him in for dinner and they talk a little bit saying how johan had some issues even when he was younger like really younger before 12 and his sister was placed in a different facility so it seems like this evil was known within johan for a very very long time probably since birth to be honest at this point people have been trying to quell that it hasn't worked and the orphanage that johan was staying in of course was extremely abusive basically had no human rights so yeah that's great of course johan's gonna be a product of that terrible environment and this guy that tenma was just talking to seems so nice and then now he seems kind of weird so i really don't know what's going on i'm kind of thinking to myself here what is the point of tenma being a surgeon right now like i'm very interested to see where that goes because he's no longer working as a surgeon and they kind of like tease the underground black market type of thing i'd be interested to see where that goes i love how this guy that worked at the orphanage and is taking care of a child says that children are a product of their environment and adults need to lead them down the right path and then he's just abusing poor Dieter here what is wrong with this guy well how are you gonna act so normal and civilized and say rational things and then the door closes and you're just child abusing all over the like and i feel so bad for tenma he keeps trying to do these nice acts of kindness and every time he does the person dies or gets hurt or something terrible happens. He tries to go get the cuckoo clock and Junkers dies. He tries to go get a soccer ball for Dieters. Dieters gets extremely injured. Like poor Tenma, he's just trying to do his best in life and he's been led down a terrible, terrible road. A nice little touching moment between Dieter as Tenma takes Dieter out of the home where he's being abused by Air Artman. He says the world is black as night. Hartman always tells me that. So poor Dieter is being raised to think the world is just sadistic and cruel and evil and just completely terrible. And Tenma still has this firm will and belief that the world is good he says no it's not all like that there are good things in the world and then gives him his soccer ball that he's been wanting so badly so nice little touching moment tenma still has his will to be positive and to fight which is good because i think he's gonna need it so what we're learning from inga the new orphanage administrator at this orphanage where tenma is trying to get Dieter to go because he does not want him going back to hartman is that 511 kinderheim which is where the previous orphanage was where johan stayed as a child was a essentially a laboratory. They're running experiments on these children to try and create pretty much an ultimate sociopath. Somebody that had no emotions, no remorse, no guilt, only sadistic and evil traits which is terrible, especially for a child to grow up like that. And she even says, can you imagine if any of the children grew up? Because the orphanage burned down. There's one left, of course, and it's Johan. There could be more, actually. There could be more, but there's one that we know of. To practice something that he couldn't control, I see, honestly, I see why he's so sadistic. I'm not condoning it. When you grow up being a human experiment, and then you keep getting into these homes where you're not treated well, I, I see why his outlook on life is not great. And Inga literally just says that all the children that were split up into factions to be trained and experimented on all fought including the staff and ended up killing each other every single one of them the scene with tenma going to Dieter and seeing that hartman used to work at that orphanage 511 kinderheim and is still like trying to pull off sadistic human experiments on new orphans literally admitting that johan was the mastermind that got all of the factions and staff to fight each other and kill each other as he watched from essentially a throne this kid is a sociopath Pathic mastermind from like the age of five or six. I don't even know how old he was, but he looks like a complete child. Look at him. He's literally like seven max. Okay, I lied. I flipped the page and it says that he was 10 years old. <laughs> He looks younger. Either way, 10 years old, making over 50 people, adults and children, fight to the death. This moment with Hartman and Dieter and Tenma is so intense. Honestly, so emotional. Dieter escapes that mind trap that Hartman has basically been putting on him, just mentally abusing him for so long and physically as well. Dieter finally decides to go with Tenma so he can get him to safety. And then Hartman just starts crying and drops his gun after he was going to shoot Dieter. Like, this man is so, so sadistic and just manipulating children like how low can you go as a human being and then Tenma decides he's gonna drop off Dieter at the bus station like a dog like come on dude you just changed this kid's life you think he's not gonna want to come with you 
touching little moment in one of the later chapters where Dr. Schumann and Tenma start hanging out. Tenma saves a patient of Dr. Schumann's. Tenma really gets to see that Dr. Schumann cares about his patient just like the way that Tenma did back when he was a surgeon. I think Tenma really needed that just to see that there are other good surgeons and other people in his field that really care about what they do because for the longest time he was just surrounded by people who did not care about the patients whatsoever. They only cared about profit or moving up the ladder. What a heartfelt moment between Tenma and Schumann and Heinz the officer as Tenma is operating on his mother to save his life. Heinz is calling in for backup, blockading the roads, contaminating the surgery room just to try and save his mom because he thinks Tenma is a murderer. But Tenma saves her life. You can see that Schumann even cares so much about Petra as well. And Schumann was just like Tenma for a little bit before Tenma realized quicker, it seems, than Schumann that he was on the wrong path. And and Schumann eventually let his wife die because he was just so engrossed in his work. Very emotional. The story is very, very emotional. Every character that you meet has some terrible story. So interesting little theory that Lunge has from the BKA on the entire Tenma situation as Ava drunkenly stumbles in to try and get Tenma arrested because she's just holding grudges till the end of time, apparently. <laughs> he thinks that Tenma has this Johan character inside him that is committing these terrible acts essentially like another form of himself that does terrible things and he locks away and then does good later i mean i guess that could have been a plot twist and maybe urasawa was like this is not what you think it is what i find interesting is that tenma is still helping people on his way to being almost caught as the entire country of germany is looking for him there's a pretty heavy theme on getting too invested in one thing and how that ruins your life and now i'm starting to realize how that is probably going to be the demise of Tenma because he is so incredibly invested in taking down Johan and making sure the evil that he thinks he created, which he kind of did and kind of didn't, and he saved him, I guess, is taken out of this earth, is removed from the universe. <laughs> the story with Lunge and his family leaving, not even noticing that his daughter is pregnant, his wife has been cheating on him, so engrossed in catching all of these criminals from the cases he's working on, gets the cases ripped away from him because he was making a mistake, and now he has nothing. He just is in solace. It is interesting to see how all these characters between Tenma, Schumann, and Lunge, and I'm sure there's others, how they just hyper focus on one thing and forget about everything around them. And all of those things end up creating severe consequences because they were never tended to. So Ava's vendetta against Tenma is not ending anytime soon. <laughs> this scene with the gardener was just terrible and interesting at the same time she actually was going to open up. But we can see once again the theme of how these people get hyper focused on one thing, that being how Tenma ruined her life, has crushed everything around her. And the one time she finally was going to open up, albeit after she completely eviscerated and roasted the gardener that she was seeing, she gets heartbroken because she was going to go spend Christmas with him and his ex-wife comes back, which honestly, I'm not going to say that she deserves it because she's not a great person. Maybe that experience will bring her some kind of character change in the future because she needs it. She really does. This manga series is like the ultimate game of cat and mouse. And honestly, I can see where a lot of films or TV TV shows have drawn inspiration from this manga. The only other thing I have to say about this chapter is the baby is very creepy. That's it. Dude, you're gonna tell me that out of all people that Tenma has been chasing or fighting, the baby is gonna be the one to capture him? Honestly, what I'm realizing from this story is that anybody who treats life as black and white are the ones that are being punished the most. I know it's his character, but why does the baby have to talk like a baby? It's creepy. It's so creepy. He's like a 60 year old man that talks like a baby. That's terrifying. It seems as though their plan is to create like a new Hitler to rule the country, which they're planning on making Johan but the thing of it is is Johan is so sadistic he doesn't care about the baby he doesn't care about any of these people that have been watching him and hoping that he will be their new leader he just cares about burning down the world I don't know I think Johan is like a level above anybody who thinks that they're evil. So I finished up chapter 27 and quite honestly it's very interesting to see how Urasawa weaves in race and the after effects of World War II with East and West Germany into this story. Like not only is he including a ton of a little bit more high level medical terminology, He's also weaving in history as well. Like this manga, aside from the storytelling itself, it's actually really funny. 
Tenma as he's being tortured by the baby. Not the baby, the baby. <laughs> I'm sorry. As he's being tortured by the baby, says that Johan will never lead your racist organization. He doesn't care about people. He just cares about everything burning, which is funny because I just said that like five minutes ago. So we're on the same wavelength, Tenma. We got it. Why do they have to keep weaving in these terribly depressing scenes like the one with Aisa? Ice? I don't I don't know how to pronounce her name. The Turkish woman who was taken captive by the baby and Nina's talking to her through the drain. They have to add these like touching little moments of humility where you can see some light in this story and then they just rip it away. They just completely rip it away. <laughs> Not gonna lie, a little bit of questionable tactics by Tenma to <laughs> let Dieter go and try and save this whole street from being burned alive because that's the baby's plan to just commit genocide on races as if there wasn't enough in World War II that was stopped and now we've got more people trying to commit uh, hate crimes. So that's apparently Dieter's gonna be the one to stop it. He's a child, he's going through so much. He was already abused. I hope that he's fine. Tenma literally told him to hitchhike back to town to save the town from being burned. That's a tall order for a young child. So we finally meet this elusive General Wolf who apparently unlocked or mastered Johan's abilities and even Johan has been taking out all of General Wolf's family, children, friends, co-workers, anything that he can get his hands on is just eliminating them all. So General Wolf really has no one left. Turns out that he wants Tenma to eliminate Johan. A little bit of a twist in the plan. We'll see what happens. Tenma and his willingness to do only good deeds tells the driver to turn the car around instead of going to kill Johan to go save the Turkish district so it doesn't burn down. Meanwhile, Nina is already on her way to where Johan said to meet General Wolf. So we've got Nina going to see Johan. Tenma was about to go, it was gonna be a 2v1, it would have been easy work. And then he turns the car around to go save more people. His good deeds are costing him every single time. This whole arc with the baby and him and his neo-Nazis trying to burn down the whole Turkish district feels very Joker-esque to me. He's sitting at this nice penthouse view, watching people trying to quell the flames of these little decoy fires he started when he's about to burn down this warehouse with a bunch of toxic chemicals inside of it. I'm not sure the entire scope of it. And it seems as though Nina was hinting at the fact that Johan did not want this. He did not want to be the next leader. He didn't want any of this plan that they had scoped out for him. Interesting climax to the arc with the fire in the Turkish district. Turns out the message that Johan left was help the monster inside of me is going to explode and what they're alluding to is saying that johan has split personality or two personalities which i guess is interesting it's not really much of a twist to me i don't know it could be wrong anyways we'll see okay so done with volume two i'm like over 800 pages in. We've got seven more volumes, about 2,800 more pages, no big deal. <laughs> I'm gonna jump into volume three. I don't think I'm gonna be able to finish this today because it is getting pretty late already. So I'm gonna try and read this one and then I'll probably try and read the next five tomorrow. I'm not too sold on the whole Johan split personality thing to me. It doesn't seem as intriguing as someone who's just that that to me is more terrifying than kind of like using mental illness a little bit as evil, but we'll see. We'll see where they go with it. I can't jump to any conclusions yet. Starting off with volume three, honestly, Urasawa is crazy. Like I've already said this, the amount of effort and research he has put into this story is, is beyond comprehension. Not only was it medically correct, not only was it historically accurate, there's also an element of psychological evaluation that he goes to his old classmate to talk about Johan with and how he talks about serial killers, their motives, and the way they act or why they do certain things. And all of it is so in-depth and also things that I have already read about or heard. Honestly, just bravo, bravo. This in particular is a very interesting scene to see them try and pick apart the messages that Johan left and interpret them as a cry for help, as using them as an excuse and what the motive is behind them. It's an interesting scene with the psychoanalyst going to Frau Kempf's house to investigate what the murder that he is talking to right now, Jürgen's, 
told him to go there and see what a monster really is and it was all of the information that scarred Jurgens as a child was set up neatly in the basement of the house where Johan we're assuming told Jurgens to go. I'm honestly not too sure what to make of this scene if the monster that Jurgens is referring to is Johan himself if it's the trauma that they go through to become who they are I'm not too sure what to make of this yet I have to think on it a little bit more honestly such a great little moment between Rudy and Tenma I thought Rudy was about to sell Tenma out to the cops but he actually helps him and gets him out and wants to prove Tenma's innocence so he cannot be pursued by the cops anymore but he still gives all the information he has finds out that Johan's been writing those letters of the monster and side of him ever since he was a kid living with Frau Kempf. It's definitely a lot of information to go over right away. There's a lot in here that's going to impact the rest of this volume minimally and at max the rest of the series but the interaction with Rudy was really endearing showing how he thought this whole time that Tenma had contempt for him because he saw him cheating in the exam, but in reality, Tenma was just cheating too, and the Tenma wanted to be friends, and it's interesting. I, I struggle with that a lot. If Rudy had not been so engrossed in his own thoughts that Tenma hated him, they could have been friends, and everything would have been completely different. So it's just interesting to see how these little intricacies can change an entire relationship between two people or two characters. I love how Urasawa throws in these little tiny comedic moments to lighten up the mood. Tenma and Dieter are hitchhiking and of course they get picked up by an ex-police officer <laughs> that's so funny to me just these little things that can drive the plot forward and make them more stressful it could have just been a nice easy car ride but Urasawa's was like nope we're gonna make it a little bit more complicated the chapter with the hitchhikers where the old man is a detective and his son committed murder right under his nose causing him to quit the police force and then knowing the whole time Tenma is wanted for murder but believe the good he saw in him honestly it's so touching. I don't know if that would happen in real life necessarily if you just go off a hunch that somebody isn't a serial killer, but it still proves a great and strong, powerful moment in the story because we see somebody immediately know that this man is wanted for serial murdering, <laughs> but through the actions in the course of getting to know him, he realized that that is not who Tenma is at all. Tenma is a great person who only wants to do good. Once again, the theme of getting caught up in your work or whatever your focus is in life and how the things around it get neglected comes up with this old man he was so hard focused on his job he left his son and his son committed murder there's so many tiny little moments of examples of these and you'd think that you'd get tired of them but seeing different examples from different people's lives is great to put into perspective and kind of take in <laughs> famous last words we'll go into town just the three of us for a change I'm sure I won't need a bodyguard. Surely not. Surely you will not need a bodyguard. You will be perfectly fine. That always happens in stories. Dang, we get a little glimpse into Air Mueller's life after he retired from being a cop and looks back on all of these strings that have been pulled in his life that led him to the path that he has been on today. Being interviewed by this detective who has the story straight with this Johan figure actually being human and real. And of course, of course, Roberto comes in and murders the detective. At least that's what Nina is saying, and she's trying to escape with Mueller. It's crazy to me that Johan impacts people's lives so heavily with doing so little. Yes, asking Mueller to do this bad favor resulted in a chain of effect that has led him all the way from being a cop to a dirty cop to joining the mob, the syndicate, getting out of the syndicate, getting married, having a kid, now coming full circle back with Nina and Johan again. I feel like I say this every time, but another really interesting chapter where Roberto kills the detective that was looking into things with Nina and Tenma. And Nina absolutely loses her shit driving away with Mueller because he says, what choice did I have when he killed her parents? When he was already selling illegal drugs and being blackmailed for it. Essentially saying that his life, even though he messed up, was better than Nina's parents. Before she kills him, he starts crying uncontrollably and talking about his family and it's hard. It's such a complex scene because Urasawa is showing the human emotion that somebody can have even if they've committed such a terrible unspeakable act in the past. These people still have love and passion for their family and their kids. It's so hard when you want to do something so bad but there's this good that you see on that side even though they have done something bad in the past. Oh my gosh, Mueller coming full circle, saving Nina 
from Johan's millions of bodyguards that he has employed, some new five random ones. That was such a cool scene to see him come back and when she goes, why'd you save me? And he goes, I told you I used to be a cop, which is so nice. He went all the way back to his roots, not even just a dirty cop when Johan found him, an actual cop. His life really changed. People can change, things can turn around. It's really nice to see. Honestly, with all of the complex themes and writing that Urasawa brings to this series, the one thing that I would take away from it is do not be a middle-aged couple that has no children in 1980s Germany. <laughs> that is the one message to take away from this story. Okay, interesting little tactic by Lunge being implemented here, having huge news outlets run the story that Tenma is still killing with this new patch of middle-aged couple that have passed away recently, the Japs or the Japs, not sure how to pronounce it in German. He really thinks that it's the uncle who stand to inherit the entire wealth of the family. But I'm assuming that by doing this, Lunge is expecting Tenma to come into town and investigate the murders because he thinks that Johan is there or was there recently. Pretty smart trap to be fair by Lun. Ooh, this talk with Tenma and Lunge or Lunge is going to be very, very spicy. I'm excited for it. Tenma fell right into his trap as he predicted, but the thing of it is, is Lunge, I'm just gonna call him Lunge. I'm sorry if it's wrong, sorry. He clearly is too tunnel visioned on Tenma. Like he will not even think of any other possibilities of how these murders have gone. He's way too far invested. He spent too much time on it. It has to be a split personality thing. And on top of it, the copycat murders that have happened that lured Tenma in, was that Lunge himself that like orchestrated this? Either way, he said he doesn't even care about the case of who did the murder. Like he clearly is way too focused on Tenma. He doesn't even care about the real aspects of his job anymore, just like Tenma was starting to do when he was doing surgery and climbing up the ladder. Interesting. It's interesting to see like all of these characters go through similar things, but in different ways. Honestly, like even the, the little detail with the killer seeing himself in the mirror, and that's why it was a kill of emotion rather than a serial killer. These tiny little details are just what makes this story insanely good. And lunge scene is crazy. The fact that Geibel comes in and stabs Lunge as he's about to kill Tenma. Tenma decides to run away, but Lunge gets in the car. They have a struggle. Tenma's handcuffed. Lunge is dying. He wants to shoot Tenma, but Tenma just wants to save his life. While the whole time, Lunge is literally talking about how Johan is the monster and how a great upstanding citizen and a doctor that Tenma is, it turns into this monster that becomes Johan while Lunch himself was literally an upstanding cop that never got a case wrong and is spending his entire life on a case that he is wrong about and is willing to murder an innocent person over actually becoming the monster that he's talking about. Of course, leave it to Ava to be the one that ends up getting mixed up with Roberto. It had to be Ava. Out of anybody, it had to be Ava. <laughs> oh, this little flashback where Ava saw Johan a year ago in Dusseldorf was pretty interesting. I didn't realize that she, I don't know how I could have, but that she was stalking Tenma for so long, but she's had contact with Johan and that's what's important. And she can verify that he is real. I swear to God, if Ava kills Dieter, I'm done. I will lose my shit. Ava will have no redemption arc. She will be worse than Johan, in my opinion. She better not do it. Okay, I take it all back. Ava gets her redemption arc. That was such a nice scene where Ava kind of saves Dieter and also saves Tenma. But then I can't tell if she's serious or if she's joking about turning him into the cops because she clearly loves him. <laughs> but it was funny. She's like, don't die on me. You know, so emotional. And then she's like, because I want to turn you in. I was going to pause and talk about this scene but it kept building and building that I couldn't stop reading it but the scene with Carl and his dad Schuwald who's a billionaire and how his mom was a prostitute and she sent him away but told him not to go to his dad and now he works for his dad because he wanted to get closer with him so he can think that he truly loves his foster parents but in reality he wants to see his real parents but his mom has passed away 
This is probably how Johan's getting so much money is he's reading to this billionaire now claiming to be the heir to his fortune. So if Johan gets billions of dollars, obviously Carl is going to be a target now, but also what is he going to do with that? I don't even know what his master plan is. Such a sweet moment. Carl's about to tell Hans that he's his son, but doesn't. I think Hans is alluding to the fact that Johan's saying he doesn't want the money. Carl actually doesn't care about the money and he gets a nice little compliment that his Latin has improved from his father that probably meant so much to him. Also, I literally forgot because so much is happening in this little arc with Carl that the whole Grapius prophecy that's going to happen, like hell is going to rain down by somebody named the Thursday boy. Why are they not putting that together? Like they need to read that article be like, uh, something's gonna happen very soon. Okay, okay, interesting. Another plot twist. They are now saying, so I thought Johan was going under the alias Edmund Farin, which was the Thursday boy that read to him. Seems that Edmund Farin had committed suicide in his own room, but my guess is that Johan is behind it and was just using Edmund as a puppet as he does in multiple other occasions. <laughs> Johan's the Friday boy. Okay, dude. Okay. The scene with Johan and Carl up on the building was very tense. I thought Johan was going to push him off, but I feel like that'd be a little too obvious. But he ends up crying when Carl tells him of his story. I'm not sure if he resonates with it. He's just being sociopathic and crying because that's what people would do in that situation. Or if he's crying because he actually has emotion and he's not truly just a complete sociopath with no emotions. All right, this story is getting more interesting because the more we finally get to see about Johan, which... To be honest, up until the end of volume three, we've gotten like nothing on him, just stories and hearsay. He's writing his thesis about an international treaty to establish standards to protect the rights of children. And he does volunteer work with orphans just for his own enjoyment, which is really nice. Like it clearly shows that he cares about children's upbringings because his was so horrendously terrible. I don't know, maybe he's not as bad as they're making him be. I don't, there's gotta be a twist. There's gotta be some kind of twist. All right, so volume three has ended and the private investigator is coming to terms with the fact that Farin may have been being controlled by his friend that came to Margot Langer. So we'll see what happens. This is a good stopping point for me. It's pretty late. I might read a little bit more of volume four. I really want to. Either way, we're jumping into volume four today or tomorrow. Oh my gosh, my hair is wild. So unfortunately, I didn't have any more time last night to continue reading Monster, but we're going to pick up with volume four, I believe. Woke up at like six today, so I'm ready. I only have one class and the rest of my day is focused and devoted to reading the rest of the series. So I'm going to jump into volume four before I have to head off. I do like the fact that Urasawa puts the private investigator, detective, whoever Schumann hired on the case that's having personal troubles of his own with his own daughter to investigate a murder where he thinks Carl is the one that killed Farman, who is having troubles with his son. It's interesting to see how they both have this weird dynamic with father-daughter and son-father. In a way, I'm pretty sure that was intentional. I love that we're finally seeing like a true first-hand account of Johan and how he manipulates people, especially with Carl. He's literally just gaining his trust day by day, second by second. Carl's literally giving him the only proof that he has that he's Schumann's son. So Johan can literally just use this free proof possibly to just become a billionaire. A little touching moment as well with Carl and his foster parents finally admitting to himself that he feels as though those are his real parents because they've always been there for him. Interesting, I'm not sure what Johan's master plan is here, but he told Schuwald that that Carl is his real son. Another touching moment after Carl just finally decided to quit Schuwald's job and Schuwald finds out that Carl is his son and they're reunited. And Johan is now Schuwald's personal assistant. So obviously he's trying to gain the money from some angle. So I've been kind of wondering why Urasawa is spending so much time on this detective. And when he looks back at the incident that caused him to get fired from the police, he realized that there was pure evil inside of the person that he killed. And it's interesting because he realized that and still chose to kill that person where, where Tenma can realize that, but still not pull the trigger. I'm pretty sure all of the cases that he was working on, Johan was the mastermind behind. So it ties in and it's funny because Johan is right under his nose the whole time. I mean, honestly, the attention to detail and the way that Urasawa weaves in all of these tiny little characters into the main plot is crazy. At the end of chapter 53, we see the therapist that has been looking after the investigator write to one of his students. Dr. 
Robert Gillen, who Tenma spoke with earlier, asks for information about Jurgens, who also talked about a monster that was telling him to do things, just like a lot of people have been mentioning. Private investigator gets fired by Schuwald and finds himself with way too much time, so he goes back to his old unsolved cases to realize that they all lead back to Johan, who was trying to isolate Schuwald from the rest of the world to, I'm assuming, gain his fortune at some point, which it seems like it's imminent and it's closing in rapidly in present time. But it's crazy because Johan is committing murders and violent acts with all different MOs, all different intervals of time, there's no specific pattern, there's nothing really to connect him other than people digging really, really deep and finding clues that connect it together. I feel like Richard the detective is gonna die. He's literally giving information about his past, how he killed that young serial killer to his ex-wife or whatever they are at this point to give to his daughter at some point and his ex-wife is realizing that he's getting back to who he was as a person instead of being a complete drunk and just caught up in all of this terrible stuff he's gonna die he's being such a great person and turning his life around and everything's going well for Richard but we finally get the origin of Johan's name he literally stole it from the Lee Bears when their son died at a young age and is using Johan's identity essentially just to move around the world so we don't even know who this Johan is at all right as Richard picks up the phone and his daughter says that they can meet Johan's knocking on his door just as some good is finally coming into this man's life, the bad is waiting right behind it. It's crazy to me how much influence Johan has over everybody that he's been manipulating in his life. Like even Jurgens, the serial killer, when questioned by Dr. Gillen and showing Johan the photo, he kills himself in the interrogation room just by looking at the photo of Johan like he knows he can't say anything otherwise terrible things will happen to him even though he's in jail and in custody. It feels like everybody protects Johan but we don't know why or how he has so much power over them. So Richard goes up on a roof with Johan, knowing that he's dangerous, has a bottle of whiskey. Clearly Johan's gonna frame his suicide. I don't know why he went up there and didn't think that something terrible was gonna happen. I really liked Richard as a character, so I'm sad to see him go. It's a weird thing with this whole situation. He killed somebody who was a serial killer and committed heinous acts of SA, but the person that he killed was underage. And Johan's argument is that kid grew up in 511 Kinderheim with unspeakable acts of horror that he had to deal with so it messed up his psyche but at what point do you feel remorse for the person that is also doing terrible acts it's a really hard situation what i don't get is they said that richard jumped off the building drunkenly at the university of munich there was just a suicide at the university of munich like what a couple weeks ago maybe by Farin? why are they not investigating students or anything at that university isn't it a little bit suspicious that they keep happening specifically there at least his counselor therapist is on the hunt because somebody needs to have their head together i wasn't expecting roberto to be the wife husband that the therapist was talking to come on he's finally doing something and making progress in this case he's the only one that is actually still doing something aside from tenma and roberto's gonna freaking take him out man the crazy thing about this story is anybody that gets involved with this case and just looks into johan in the slightest bit just runs down this rabbit hole and ends up dying tenma comes through and saves the day roberto is not getting another kill not today why is lung lunge so obsessed with Tenma being evil like I understand that you've spent your entire life thinking Tenma has committed these crimes but dude just be objective for one second and what I don't understand is why is Gillen like giving him all of this free information about Tenma when he's clearly disregarding it it seems like lung might have some ulterior motive I don't know such a touching story with the old man in the woods and Tenma but I feel like that that story just convinced Tenma to not kill Johan in those woods and honestly I don't know if Tenma can even go through with it even though he's been devoting his whole life to it because at the end of the day he doesn't seem like a killer so I don't know if he'll do it. This little interaction with Dieter and Martin that sadistic kid that Johan has been training when I originally said Johan was doing good by giving back to these kids in the orphanage no he's just performing 511 Kinderheim v2 to these kids teaching them to play games where they end up committing suicide accidentally but if they survive they're chosen like dude what so we finally see that johan has a weakness something this picture book that he picked up from an author in czech 
which is where he and his sister were found at the border of Czech. So there's something, he must be from Czech. There's gotta be some kind of history with that because he literally passes out when seeing it or hearing the name. Of course, Lottie's the one that gets the most crucial information about this picture book. There's gotta be a scene or something in that book that resonates with Johan. Well, this conversation with Johan and the Red Hindenburg is interesting. They've been planning taking Schuwald's wealth for two years now, which is a very long time because Johan is so young and he's been plotting all these intricate schemes since he was like 10. Volume 4 is read and done. It's ending in a lot of tense situations. We have Dr. Gillen speaking to a serial killer, saying what Johan's next moves would be if he were Johan. We also have the therapist Reichman, I believe is his name, going to the Liebherr's house to explain who Johan really is and trying to get them to safety. All the meanwhile, Tenma setting up in the library to assassinate Johan while Schumann speaks and donates all of his books. Lottie is investigating that picture book as well, where they speak of this monster. It seems like it's a picture book about monsters. I'm interested to find out, like, is this book about Johan? Did Johan revolve his persona around this book? Like, I don't know, I've got a lot of questions. There's a lot I feel like that's going to happen in this next volume. This volume was very good, but it was like a pure setup, I feel like, for volume five. So I'm gonna jump into it. Turns out I actually had zero time before class. I didn't realize what time it was. So I'm back after class and I am ready to read volume number five. We get a little interesting conversation between Schumann and Richard's therapist slash counselor where he tries to expose Johan for everything that he did and has done in the past. And Schumann already kind of knew. He said, nobody can be that perfect. Even though he's blind, he can still sense the abnormality that Johan is presenting himself to be like this model citizen. And he says he wanted to be a monster like that too. His nickname was the Vampire Bavaria. He says, perhaps only a monster can overcome another monster. So who is he referring to? Himself? Is he referring to Tenma? I'm not sure. Maybe he is referring to himself. Interesting that Schumann is sending Carl back to the house while he knows that Tenma is planning to assassinate Johan at this inauguration speech. Is he playing his own son? Is Johan at the house? Because Johan's not here. Schumann says he's going to come, but every time someone says something, it never happens. <laughs> That's what I've come to realize in this story. There's always a twist in the plan. Ooh, I'm really excited. We finally get to see the picture book that made Johan faint. And Johan is being very weird and cryptic at this conference. I think he obviously knows what's up. I'm not sure what's going to happen because Lung is over here like embodying Henma, thinking that he is Tenma, trying to put himself in his shoes to see what his next move is. He thinks he's going to assassinate Schumann, which I feel like might accidentally happen and then might just further make Lung dive deeper into this rabbit hole of Tenma being the serial killer that he's not and thinking that Johan is just a figment of his imagination. I don't know who authorized this children's picture book, but it is not okay for children to be reading this. Honestly, if Johan just read this book alone, he would already be messed up. Dude, Tenma just pulled the trigger, man. Just pull the trigger. I understand it's so hard for him, especially because he's a doctor. It probably makes it harder. He literally took an oath to do no harm and now he has to, or he feels like he has to take Johan Johan out of this world. His hesitancy has screwed him over freaking Roberto. Dude, Roberto has been like the most clutch character for Johan that there has been. Henma has taken his first life. Oh my gosh, I was just thinking how the mercenary that he was working with said that you have to know to be able to pull the trigger. You know if you can. And it seems like Tenma feels like he has to. He literally has no other choice. Once you fire that first bullet, you can never go back. Is Tenma just gonna go on a rampage after this? Is he gonna become the monster? I don't know. Maybe that was Johan's plan all along. That'd be crazy. This this book is just nuts. Like, who is this cynical? Dude, I'm sorry, but there is no way that Johan could have the foresight to murder Carl's mother from a young age. Like, Carl gets this note that Schumann told them to go back to the house and fetch, and it literally says that two people tried to cross the Czech border. One of them was sent back. Margot Langer, who was Carl's mother, made it through. Had a son with Schumann, but the the lady who was sent back had twins, one of which ended up with Margot Langer, who looked just like her, aka Johan. <laughs> so what you're telling
telling me is Johan at like the age of six or whatever was able to infiltrate and have this master plan from that age? Nina, what are you doing? Why are you ruining Tenma's moment to take Johan out? I don't know if she didn't want him to take him out because she felt like it wasn't his responsibility and didn't want him to lead a, a life of murder and doing the wrong thing. But that that little second of time ruined everything. I mean, there were shots fired, so we don't know what happened yet, I guess. Or at least I couldn't tell. Hopefully Schumann's not dead. I feel bad for him as well. It seems like his whole life has been crumbling around him and he doesn't know why until now. That scene with Johan and Schumann, when Johan looks directly into his eyes, even though Schumann is pretty much blind at this point, is crazy. And then Schumann goes, I see hell in his eyes. Three little frogs. I don't know what this three little frogs is an indication of, but I guess we're going to find out because Nina knows about it as well. Pretty crazy that the mother is supposedly still alive of Nina and Johan. So I'd like to see Tenma go visit her and see what information she has. Maybe she gave up Johan because he was so sadistic from an early age, but Nina doesn't make sense. So I don't know. I feel like I can usually see where things are going or coming from, but with this, it, there's so many little intricacies that I'm just gonna ride it out and enjoy it. Who's this former spy mystery man that knows about Tenma on the train? And I love how Arasawa brings in these characters. It's a little bit convenient how they come in, but it's also because probably have pre-information that we don't know about as the reader, but they're always great. Like there's really been no character that I have disliked, aside from the ones that you're supposed to dislike. Interesting little conversation between Tenma and Grimmer. Grimmer actually says, those sins don't go away but we still have to do what we have to do which is interesting because for the longest time Tenma has been grappling with the fact that he has to kill Johan but he feels like he needs to but you can tell he doesn't really want to but it seems like Grimmer is almost encouraging him and saying it's okay so that's like the first time we've gotten a perspective where somebody has said it's okay to do what you feel like you need to do whereas everybody else doesn't want Tenma to turn into the person that starts murdering people when he was a doctor saving lives this whole interaction with Grimmer and Pet Petrov is very interesting. It seems as though Petrov was the director of the 511 Kinderheim and specialized essentially in brainwashing the children. And he repeatedly claims that his experiment was a success and he left when Johan got there. So nothing that Johan did there, including burning it down, was his fault or responsibility. But what is the success? Because when Grimmer goes back to Petrov's home, it seems as though he's like doing some sort of new experiment with all of these new orphans that he's just fostering in his home. We see a mystery woman in the park and now Petrov is dead along with his wife, which is sad because Petrov, even though he's done some pretty inhumane things in his past, has now done a full 180 and really did love these kids. He wasn't planning anything, supposedly. He said, I wanted to cultivate human beings who want to be overcome by darkness. Love, a totally new discovery. Feels like he really did overcome the evil that was inside of him. He gives Grimmer the instructions to find all of the tapes and information of 511 Kinderheim, which I am very, very interested to see because Petrov kept claiming that the experiments were a success on Johan to make him recount his past. They're drugging a child to make him recount a traumatic experience. I can only imagine why Johan is so messed up. All right, so volume five wraps up with Grimmer and Suck, Suk, having a conversation in the park and Grimmer throws, I'm just gonna call him Suck, the key to the safe box with all of Petrov's findings and experiments. I don't know why he did that. I guess because he's a detective, he might be able to do more with it than Grimmer can. It was definitely an interesting exchange between the two and I'm not sure where it's gonna go with them. It's crazy how many people have been affected by just this one human being over just the course of five volumes so far. Couple things I'm finding interesting off the bat in volume six is one, the amount of research, I've said this before, but that Urasawa puts into this manga is absolutely phenomenal. Now, after touching on history, after touching on medical, after touching on serial killer motives, he now jumps into political worldviews, not necessarily his worldviews, but the way the world was at the time in the 90s and 80s. And it's just incredible to see. On top of this, the other thing that I will say is that Nina talking to Suk or Suk, I like to say Suk, and him just realizing how bad the world really is and how, I guess, disillusioned his worldview was. He thought the world was great and then he realizes there's so much darkness around him. I mean, I can resonate with that, but the thing of it is, is you have to keep hope. Him not keeping hope will only drive him down further into the darkness. And on top of that, he says he doesn't need to know Nina's name, but he feels like he can tell her anything. And that's a very similar characteristic that we haven't really seen 
seen or had anyone say to Nina, but is always said about Johan. Everybody puts their full trust into Johan. They feel super comfortable with him. Just food for thought. We see Johan go home and take off a wig. No wonder that guy felt like he could say anything to Johan. Interesting that the Prague Police Department doesn't trust Detective Suk. They think that he is connected to some kind of special force or whatever it may be. Now I can't tell. Are they insinuating that the police department is corrupt or is Detective Suk corrupt? We're finally going to find out what is in that safety deposit box. Johan and the police are tailing Grimmer and Suk. So I don't know if they're gonna like infiltrate as they're listening to it, but I need to know what's on this tape. Hope that they don't spoil it. So Johan goes to the apartment where Suk lives and kills the investigators, but not him. And I'm assuming that he just took the tape. It's also kind of weird that it seems like he planted the evidence on Suk so he would get arrested, but then goes and kills the officers that would arrest him. I don't know. I'm mostly upset at Grimmer right now because he decided eh, it's not worth listening to the tape. We're gonna be in trouble no matter what. Well, if you're going to be in trouble, no matter what, you might as well go all out, right? Like, <laughs> come on, dude. What really amazes me about this story is that the same MO happens over the years with the whiskey bonbons and the muscle relaxant, killing three superiors. Tenma puts it together right away, of course, because he's been involved. But even the murders of the middle-aged couples that are childless, nobody goes, hey, let's look for this one person that's doing this. They keep like bouncing around from suspects. They think Suk killed these people in his own home. They think he gave the whiskey bonbons to the investigators. Clearly, someone has been doing this for so long. Why are you just like pinpointing it on the first person that's close by? Okay, my question is answered. Literally, Grimmer can put it together that, oh, this happened 10 years ago in Dusseldorf. Seems like the perp is still out there. But the funniest thing to me is Tenma goes to visit Jan's mother in the hospital uh, because he thinks that he might be there and his mother's completely out of it. She's ill. She's just joyfully listening to the tapes about the monster and and she also has the file as well and Grimmer is clearly not a freelance journalist he just bodied everybody that came into where Suk and him were hiding it's so odd it, like that one moment while Grimmer was hiding in the corner and Suk was dying after being shot twice and he's just losing his mind while these people are so calm around him just asking what they want to eat for dinner that's pretty messed up. I'm assuming that Grimmer must be like some ex special force or special ops because he alluded to beating two people to death when he was taken earlier. And then now he just took out like a whole special force team. So he's clearly got some kind of past that he has been keeping from us. It's so sad to see Suk be possibly killed at the place where he first decided he wanted to be a detective and where he wanted to play detective. I guess that could be a nod to him actually playing detective. He goes to the place where he used to act it out and clearly he does not have the strength to fight back he just got absolutely demolished i don't know i could be reaching there but right pause turns out grimmer was a part of 511 kinderheim but why is he good why is he a good person weren't they like trained to just be pure evil and hatred i'm interested grimmer is a very interesting story but what i'm wondering is is grimmer on johan's side or is he having a redemption arc like what is what is going on with grimmer right now and another thing that i find so hilarious is every time there's like a shootout or a fight Tenma takes care of everyone the medics always come through later and are like oh it seems that medical care has been expertly applied to these people it's just like this mysterious medical hero that that saves all these people's lives and then just disappears this secret police member that Grimmer and Tenma were meeting with accidentally sent his nephew there without doing any research and turns out that Grimmer remembered him it's very depressing it seemed as though their entire goal was to mold them into these heartless warriors and make them forget all of their memories. They would tell their friends in 511 memories of themselves so people wouldn't forget them. It's very, very grim for children having to endure things like this. Okay, so within the Czech police, there was a man named Franz Bonaparte who literally wrote these sadistic children's books and pulled all the strings from the top and had the most control and authority over these police. Were these books meant to mold the minds to start with like 511 Kinderheim? Or I don't know, I've got so many questions. Like, I love this manga, but the issue is such a slow burn 
and with good reason it's very realistic like you don't just find a killer the day after something happens there's a lot of hoops and things that you have to go through especially when somebody's running away from you and 10 steps ahead of you he's just giving me crumbs 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 give me the cake man come on this is a very interesting little line from Grimmer. he says yes i've dedicated myself to finding out what happened at 511 kinderheim even if everything comes to light my life won't change which is honestly true for most people in this situation. Tenma, for example, decided to change his entire life because of what happened. Most characters in this story decided to change their life because of what happened. And not necessarily for the better, it was also for the worse in a lot of ways. They've all kind of given up on normalcy just to find out and unravel this mystery. Dude, I love that Long was on vacation in Prague, but clearly he's going to investigate. So we see that Bonaparte, or whatever his name is, he's gone under many aliases, that children's book illustrator has literally Literally drawn a pregnant woman and the twins because we have seen pictures of Nina as a young child and Johan and there they are drawn in these rough sketches so is Bonaparte the father possibly maybe I don't know trying to put things together actually such a sad moment where Grimmer goes to the little experiment that Petrov was running by raising orphans with love I don't know why they decided that they were gonna raise them with hate the first time why not start with love and then maybe if it didn't work out try the worst option <laughs> but nonetheless Grimmer gets a little envelope with one of the boys favorite soccer players a picture of him and he goes I don't know how to react to this what sort of facial expression should I have and that's honestly so heartbreaking because this man grew up with zero emotions all of his emotions were stripped away from him and to this day he still doesn't know how to react to normal things it's very very sad I'm a little bit confused about Johan impersonating Nina his sister because clearly from the recording at 511 Kinderheim which he cut off the last part he cut off was please let me remember Nina my sister or Anna or whatever he calls her but he's literally impersonating her and committing crimes literal murder now he's kidnapped the child is Anna gonna go to jail because that doesn't seem like he really cares about Anna or Nina or whoever he wants to call her one of the most sadistic things in this manga so far aside from all of the mass genocide that's been happening is freaking Johan dressing as Anna committing mental terrorism on this poor child Milos saying why do you live there's no point don't you think your mom abandoned you death happens more than life anyways your birth was just a momentary blip in the universe like dude calm down this is just a child it's so brutal and he went through it so obviously he's evil but gosh man Johan there's such a touching moment Milos and Grimmer are the best duo in this manga <sighs> gosh Johan he literally strips this kid of all of his innocence in about probably 30 minutes going to the red light district watches some pretty graphic things and then is about to commit suicide because he's just so traumatized Grimmer actually shows emotion shows that he wants Milos and cares for Milos looks like Long may be digging a little too deep he's going to the house of roses and has found like a little secret door Lange warned him if you get too close but Long doesn't care Long has dedicated his entire life to proving Tenma's guilty and he might pay the price because of it. In this sealed up doorway, Lung finds a giant portrait of the mother of the twins. I'm assuming Johan and Nina. Interesting because the whole time they made it seem like she was a prostitute and that she basically sent her kids away, but there's a giant portrait of her hanging in a mansion. The story's not lining up. There's obviously something that is missing from here. I didn't think it was a big deal when Tenma met the editor for Bonaparte and he called the police because he's had the police on him for like the past 10 years. He hasn't gotten caught, but now he's freaking surrounded. And that goodbye by Grimmer. Dude, Grimmer's such a good character. I actually love that man. He went from being neglected, abused, doesn't even know his own name, barely has any memory memories to just being this pure beacon of hope saves Milos saves Suk like he's just a great person I love I love Grimmer I wanted to come back I really liked him we find out from a little flashback from 1976 Margot Langer is actually Helenka Novakova <laughs> wait actually crazy when Schumann went to visit Margot's friend in Prague who she was really close to the twins mother he was saying that the two twins were listening to every single thing that he said about Margot or Helenka. So that's how Johan knows, but his memory is impeccable. 
And what's crazy to me is he went to 511 Kinderheim where they were supposed to be removing everybody's memories, but yet he remembers all of this information about Margo. No shot is Ava going to weasel her way back in this story by being a patient of this therapist. <sighs> Tenma arrested. So, I mean, this volume hasn't finished yet, but I'm assuming the next volume might be interrogation. I'm going to be interested. It's got to be like a face off between Long and Tenma. Honestly, such a sweet gesture from all of Tenma's patients. They're going to chip in and get him a really good defense attorney. That's so heartwarming. It just goes to show you that if you just continuously do the right thing in life, good deeds will be repaid to you. That's honestly so sweet. Everybody loved Tenma. He even sat in the cafe where all of the patients would be rather than sitting with the doctors. Just an all around good guy. And, and his legacy remains that. And hopefully it's not tainted by being blamed for murders a decade ago. And then they're just pinning more stuff on him. I feel so bad for Tenma, but these patients, so nice. Okay, Ava's coming forth with some critical information saying that she's the only one who can save Tenma at the end of this volume, saying that she knows something, she saw it. So we'll see what she saw in the next volume. I was just talking about the patients, but literally, Shuwald, the rich billionaire, tells Carl to round up some of the best defense lawyers. We have that doctor that was doing backdoor surgery for, for illegal immigrants that Tenma really inspired to just go and be a doctor and study hard. She wants to help. Everybody just wants to help Tenma because he saved so many lives, even Dr. Schumann in the village. It's inspiring to see just keep doing good deeds and you will leave a good mark on this world. So that is the end of this volume. I don't really want to review volumes because I'm just talking about it as they go. I planned on reading this all in one day, but that, <laughs> that went out the window. Okay, it's a new day, same me. I went to bed thinking about this story and I woke up thinking about this story. I cannot wait to get volume number seven started. So not only does Lung find that portrait that looks like the mother of both Johan and Nina, he also finds a cryptic note behind that we don't get to read, but he says that he is deciding to stay in Prague because he wants to further investigate what is going on and try and find more information. And he actually refused to be there for Dr. Tenma. So I'm wondering if he he's not going to be the one that interrogates Tenma. And if that's the case, that's honestly a good thing. Because right now, I'm assuming that Lung is still just not going to listen to anything and assume that Johan is Tenma's alter ego. So it's probably better if he doesn't interrogate him. So from what I'm gathering, the message behind the portrait is the husband of Anna, the girl in the portrait, who is what I'm assuming the mother of the twins. I'm not entirely sure who has wrote this note. It's a little bit cryptic, but I'm sure we'll find out. Hey, they weren't lying when they said they were going to hire the best defendants for Tenma here. Here. Fritz Verdemann, this guy has a vendetta. He is willing to fight for anybody. His story is depressing. I feel so bad for him. He's exonerated every single person that's been falsely accused that he has represented. So I feel like when Fritz read off that list of people that wanted him to defend Tenma, it reinstored a little bit of hope into him. And hopefully that reinvigorates him to really crack down and make sure he can remember every detail to win this case. So they've only showed Fritz Verdemann, one of the two lawyers that is representing Tenma. The other is Bauer, I'm pretty sure his name is. They haven't shown him at all. So I don't know what's up with that. It's a little bit suspicious. And on top of it, Ava needs to disclose the information that she was following Tenma that night. I know she wants him to rot in jail, but like, come on, there's no way. There is no way she can hold the grudge for like 10 years. Just help the poor guy out. No shot. Roberto is still alive, weaseling his way into this process and being hired as Tenma's lawyer. Like what? And no wonder they're withholding it. But how did he get that job? Don't you have to like prove that you're an actual attorney? I'm so confused. Wow. So Roberto confesses that he wants to kill Ava Heinemann because she knows too much. Tenma literally got his world shattered by Ava and her father. His life pretty much ruined at that point. And he still wants to break out of prison to save Ava. This man just wants to keep peace and have nobody else die. At first I was like, why is Tenma admitting to all these murders that he didn't do? But I think he's playing mind games with Ava because he knows that she wants him to suffer, but she wants him to suffer at her own will, not by anyone else's volition. So she's not gonna let him rot in jail. She's gonna confess just to get him out. <laughs> oh, good old Milch is saving the day with his 13th prison break. <laughs> Gustav's taking one for the team. That's all we can really say. Gustav 
love is taking one for Dr. Tenma. Oh, Tenma might escape and he might make things happen. Thank God. Okay, I retract my statement because Tenma now wants to save Gustav. I keep forgetting that he is a man of righteousness. He will not let anybody die on his watch. So he's probably just gonna get arrested again when he takes him to the hospital, but at least his conscience is clear. We've got an interesting situation between Lung and Verdamin. The first thing that I find interesting is Lung has never not put away a criminal that he's been investigating and Verdamin has always exonerated every defendant <laughs> that he has taken on so it's the best of both worlds right here and as they face off we see Lung imply that Verdamin's dad was actually a spy even though he got posthumously exonerated Lung is implying that he actually might have been a spy and he was friends with Bonaparte the author who wrote that children's book I gotta keep remembering that every time a character is introduced they always have some connection with some part of the story they're not just inherently thrown in there just to be a character Verdamin's dad was actually a spy actually knew Franz Bonaparte and poor freaking Verdamin literally wanted to become a lawyer just because he was wanted to exonerate his father and he found out that he was actually a spy oh my everybody's convening at the red rose mansion unintentionally we've probably got roberto and ava there already tenma's on his way regman and verdamin are in route as well <sighs> things are about to pop off and I don't know if I'm prepared. Makes sense why Nina is so messed up. The scene where she recounts a flashback of all of these dead people who have been poisoned in that room in the Red Rose Mansion. Okay, so Nina passes out at the Red Rose Mansion and some random guy named Lipsky finds her and Dieter there, takes her back to his home. The doctor says she can leave and go back to her family and he insists that she's gonna stay there. And he even says you're welcome to stay here forever if you want. There's something weird about this guy. Why was he at the Red Rose Mansion? That's the place he wants to imagine that he wants to build or live in and he's a puppeteer which is creepy enough honestly the puppets that he's playing with I don't trust this guy there is no way that he is not bad although maybe maybe Urasawa is making me think that he's bad but he's good I don't know Urasawa is playing with my mind at this point so this Lipsky fellow was a part of Franz Bonaparte's reading group he supposedly wasn't a gifted child so he got kicked out of the reading group but he has a ton of books by Franz Bonaparte so Nina can find out a lot of information although this guy's a little tweaked I'm not gonna lie the puppet story that he recreates every day is essentially like Johan's story so what I'm gathering it almost seems like a hypnosis type technique Johan has arrived I'm pretty sure at the Red Rose Mansion and he was dressed as Nina but he seems to have taken his wig off so that's good there won't be any confusion this whole time I've been worrying that Nina's either going to get arrested or killed or something because he keeps dressing like her so it seems like a lot of Bonaparte's stories are connected there's a kid named Johan in one of his stories called the peaceful god all of his stories have a thematic element of the devil being pretty much a central theme and then on top of this Johan at the Red Rose Mansion confirmed that Anna is his mother in that portrait so we already kind of knew that interesting enough he says even you couldn't tear us apart mother Nina Anna the name doesn't matter she was me and I was her. Uh, I kind of get it now. I kind of get it. I am you and you are me. And he said that to Nina as well. So he's, I'm assuming, saying that because he is so sadistic and evil. He came from Anna and he's a twin of Nina. That they all have that monster inside of them as well. Is what I'm gathering? All right, so Johan loves to be an arsonist, burns down the Red Rose Mansion. Nina gets that brutal flashback of the moment that she realizes that Johan has been killing everyone that they've been living with. He tells her to shoot him right here which is so traumatic as a child. One, you're finding out that your brother is a serial killer. And not only that, he just murdered two people and is now asking you to kill him. It's a lot for a child. We finally get to see the whole scene. And he says, don't worry if I'm gone. I am you and you are me. Get out of here before the monster catches up. It seems as though that flashback has triggered something in Nina because she has said that the monster has came to the apartment that she's now in with Lipsky. There's a lot to unpack in these past few scenes. General Wolf has passed away, but we find out that he was the one that found Johan and Nina at the border. And what they did was bring them to this group, I'm assuming, in the Red Rose Mansion. But what we also find out is because of that fire that Johan started, I'm assuming intentionally, there are piles and piles of human skeletons is what the officer said. That's so, so scary. He said they were conducting experiments 
I don't know if this was like a pre 511 Kinderheim thing or after 511 Kinderheim. I'm not really sure. But Wolf also says the rampage is about to begin. So we find out that Lipsky is Franz Bonaparte's son. Lung has confronted him. We don't know what's going to happen next. It seems as though he was trying to slowly awaken these memories in Nina. And he clearly has remorse. His father never liked him. Obviously, he kicked him out of the freaking reading group, his own dad. And it's honestly sad because because Lipsky is also just like conveying all of his emotions through his puppets. So what he says is that he hopes that Nina has a happy ending. So that was really sweet. I hope she does too. I hope somebody has a happy ending in the story. Volume 7 leaves me with a lot of questions. <laughs> Martin, the bodyguard that was hired to look after Ava so she doesn't die, has seen a bunch of things. He says he's seen the monster. He has this whole story to tell Dr. Tenma, but unfortunately, he's been shot a bunch of times. I don't know if it was because he was wearing the same tie that Tenma used to wear and Ava bought it for him. Honestly, I really don't know what to make of the end of this. There's a lot happening. There's a lot converging. Urusawa is still keeping so much from me and there's only two volumes left. I really am having a hard time seeing how this is all going to wrap up. We're going to move on to volume eight and hopefully we get some answers. They want Martin to now kill Ava. I guess we're just getting to the point where he was shot and bloodied in the car trying to go talk to Tenma and tell him who the monster is. Seems as though Ava pointed at Johan at a party and that was her purpose that was fulfilled and then she was gonna die. Funny how Martin just stumbled into what I believe is Johan's room with another guy that was at that party. He goes, shall we chat while we wait? Hmm, what are some good topics that we can talk about? The weather, sports, your common interests. Nope, let's talk about the end of the world. Yeah, that's a good first topic. <laughs> but it seems as though Martin's gonna accidentally infiltrate and find out what Johan is up to. So maybe he does know what the monster is. Yet again, another character with a horrific life and past. Martin heard his girlfriend kill herself in the next room as she was just cheating on him with her ex-boyfriend and was back addicted to drugs after she got clean. Then Martin killed the ex and then he let his mom freeze to death even though he didn't. He Martin was 10 years old and would drag his drunken mother through the streets back home and one day he just didn't do it and she passed away. I feel so bad for these people, I really do. And even though Martin's girlfriend committed suicide, he still confessed to killing her because he wanted her to die, I'm assuming with some respect. All I know is I feel terrible for Martin and this guy knows way too much information about him. I really hope that we find out how Johan has so much information about all of the people that come into this world where they're trying to figure him out. That to me is the most interesting part because that's how he stays like 10 steps ahead of everyone. Of course Martin passes away but honestly him and Ava had a really sweet connection. Ava is sort of redeeming herself in a weird way to me and that was a really nice bond that they formed. Urusawa is now adding a new character in volume 8. Someone named Peter Kapik, Peter Chapik, I don't know how to pronounce it because it's Czech I believe. Basically says he wants to control the devil but the devil is more, more terrible than this hotel room, more terrible than and then doesn't say anything and then gives the hotel room for the devil's apprentice and Peter was a survivor from the Red Rose Mansion so I'm assuming that Peter and Johan must have known each other from back in the day. I know Ava is wrapped up in Kenzo, I know she's distressed from Martin dying but why is it that these characters have this hero complex where they think that they can just finish everything for themselves? She freaking gets off the train and goes and gets a gun so she can kill Johan herself. Just go home, go home for your own good. Everybody is dying. I don't want any more characters to die. I feel like Tenma at this point. Too many people are dying in this story. All right, so Nina's got her memory. We don't know what it is, but she's got a memory. I'm sure it's a very large significance, but I'm also sure that I'm not going to find anything out until the last volume. Okay, we get to see Sook back at the job. It seems like he's changed and he's taken Lung's advice and just literally gone full detective mode. It's, he used to kind of play detective, it seemed like, but he's here to create justice along with very man at his side so this is going to be an interesting duo for sure i love how these characters meet and they don't know how invested i am in them honestly i know how invested verdamin is in this case but 
he's flying a little too close to the sun because his father was involved in these experiments at Red Rose Mansion. It's not good because they need to extract anything they can from these witnesses. Something I do find interesting is there's been this theme of everybody not knowing their name or not having their own identity. And the last interviewee that they had, honestly, such an endearing moment after Verdeman blows up on this witness. He then finds out that his father, even though he was a spy and working at the Red Rose Mansion, told him to leave and get out as fast as he can. So maybe he was actually a defector and was trying to save as many people as he could. I hope that brings some peace and solace to Verdeman because he needs it. We've got expert psychoanalyst Dr. Gillen on the case trying to unlock Nina's memories. I hope it doesn't cause her too much trauma, but I'm very interested to see what she says because I've been waiting. They keep hinting that they know something from the past and nothing comes out, so I'm ready. I'm getting so tired of the same line being repeated. I understand everything now. I know who I am. I know where Johan's going and where he came from. Tell me then. <laughs> tell me, please. Somebody tell me. Interesting though, she says that she's home. It almost, I'm not sure what to make of it, but it almost seems like she's seeing memories through Johan's memories. Something of that effect. I honestly cannot tell. All right, so now we've got the person that takes Tenma in as he's on the run from the cops who also wants to kill Peter Capic or Peter Chapic. I mean, I don't I don't my brain is broken at this point. So many characters keep getting introduced that have some random connection. I just want to know what's happening. All right, so it makes sense. It seems like Peter moved to Frankfurt and has been pushing the Turks and immigrants out of this neighborhood, joined a right wing extremist group and also caused Milan's son to commit suicide. Apparently, a lot of kids when they joined this reading group followed suit. So I get why he has a grudge against him. So not only that, Peter and Milan grew up together even though they were from different classes and they were not meant to be friends. It seems as though they've known each other for a while which confuses me because shouldn't you have figured out that Peter might have had some warning signs that he was a little bit sadistic? Well, unsurprisingly, Milan has failed his mission to kill Peter and avenge everybody that Peter has killed, including his son. I mean, I'm not surprised. He literally just walked out into a convention and tried to execute him there, kind of asking for failure from the start. Hopefully good old Tenma can come through and save the day eventually. I love this. The inspector or the detective is about to retire and just chill forever. And then the last guy that he interviews gives off some information that he took in Johan and Anna and Johan gave him that extra push to start committing murder. What a great person Johan is. Obviously not. The funny part is he's about to retire and he goes, 30 hours left before I retire. <laughs> so he's, he's literally going to try and solve this case in 30 hours because of that distant memory 11 years ago. What a guy. So it seems as though Johan was setting forth some plan of murders that didn't seem like they were connected, but in fact are for the future when he was a child where he met these serial killers at Greisheim Park, giving them instructions to kill certain people by writing their names in the sand. I'm having this thought because one of the serial killers said that he was a vampire and maybe, just maybe, just a thought, Schuwald, it's called the Vampire of Bavaria. Are they linked? Is Schuwald actually not who he's leading on to be? I don't know. So the baby is dead by a prostitute or something that he paid to spend time with. So Johan has a theory that Franz Bonaparte is still alive and out there somewhere. I'm not sure what he wants to gain from him. I guess Franz Bonaparte's program was why Johan is so evil, but we will see. I feel like he's going to be ancient at this point. The Devil's Apprentice ended up at 511 Kinderheim as well, being one of the two that survived. Him and Johan have been planning things since they were just little children and he describes this massacre as everybody at 511 going insane and just killing each other children adults didn't matter who this volume ends with nina implying that she has seen something 10 times worse than what johan had seen and what made him put this plan into action it's ramping up and it's ramping up quick <laughs> one i feel really bad for ava i mean he left her with a beautiful note maybe they'll reconvene at some point in my heart she has redeemed herself i really did not like her but shows that people can change final volume here we go
I mean, Urasawa is already teasing a showdown. He's already teasing it. I'm so nervous. This has been a slow burn for so long. Eight volumes of a beautiful, tense, frustrating at times, slow burn. And it's all coming to an end. This is starting off way too crazy. I don't know if Johan is manipulating his sister right now, telling his recount of the story, saying that Johan came home after seeing that massacre and told Nina everything and she just didn't react at all. So so that's really what could have driven him into madness because the one person he always cared about and tried to help was his sister. But she looks like she might commit suicide. I really don't want that to happen. I love Nina. A pretty big change of plans here. <laughs> Turns out that Nina was the one who was actually experiencing all those memories. But why is it that Nina has been so cool, calm, and collected? Is it because she repressed those memories and then embraced them like Johan has been? Or is this Johan's plan all along to suppress them until the time was right and then unleash her inner demon, I guess, that she's been struggling with? So We've got Johan saying that he's awakened from a dream. Nina noticing that he was crying, but also smiling as she was talking to him right there. I'm wondering if Johan snapped out of like this psychosis that he believed that he was living through Nina's trauma. We haven't seen Long in a while, and it seems as though he is finally one step ahead of Johan, maybe. Johan has been leading everybody down this road, doing essentially whatever he has planned, but Lung might have actually gotten the upper hand this time. He's in the small town on the outskirts, Lung and Grimmer in the same hotel. Oh man, I was gonna say, what are the odds? But at this point, it seems like everything is connected. I'm just excited to see Grimmer again. I really loved him as a character. Yep, there's the answer. Grimmer says, do you think we can stop it? The horrible massacre that's about to take place in this town. Why? Why this town? Why a horrible massacre? So many questions and I've only got this much left. I have a lot of questions, Urasawa. Please answer them. So I'm not sure about this old couple that's winning the lottery, but it's really funny. The husband went out to get a bunch of guns to protect themselves. He's like, you didn't tell anybody that you won the lottery, right? Come to think of it, she accidentally might have given it away to like four people already. But also what I'm a little bit confused about is this whole town situation. We've got drawings of Johan and Nina. So clearly something's been plotted since the beginning in this town. It's honestly just so creepy and me when like people start acting so suspiciously nice but while doing sadistic things this old couple giving the drunk father a gun and saying your son has one too someone killed a cat someone killed poor conrad just trying to gather his lingonberries i swear if tenma dies going to this little village while johan's planning the perfect suicide and doesn't say bye to dieter even though he saw him crying i'm going to be so sad i know he did it for dieter's sake so dieter doesn't try and go with him but come on man Johan's plan is to recreate the massacre at Red Rose and also the massacre at 511 Kinderheim by doing this in Runenheim. I'm not sure because it seems as though Bonaparte is still alive there. Are they going to carry it out together? Does Bonaparte have a different agenda than Johan? What are the odds that there's going to be a flood at the same time that Johan is planning this massacre in this town so nobody can leave? The trains are not coming. Everybody's stuck. So we now learn from this children's book fanatic that there is another book by Helmuth Voss who he theorizes is also Pape, Claus Pape, or Bonaparte. But in this book, it's not as sadistic. It's about a thief who goes to this remote town and ends up falling in love with a peaceful, quiet light. So honestly, it just seems like Bonaparte has been speaking about himself. They're like all autobiographical, essentially children's books. And this was probably his last one. Lung needs to know when not to speak up because I am thinking that this old couple that says they're not locals and lives in this little hotel is Bonaparte. It has to be. And he calls him out and says, your shoes are muddy. So he was going out in torrential downpour doing something. He's been stirring up trouble in this town. This might have just been the plan is to plant small little seeds around this town and everybody eventually just starts turning on each other. You're kind of taught to ignore the bad and always try and do good. But what happens when evil comes and encourages you to do the opposite? For instance, the kid who they call trash, his drunken father, a gun, and he goes into the bar to try and get a drink. They turn him away and then start talking shit right as he's outside. He can hear it all. And he has a gun on him. Who knows? His life has been terrible forever. He might just not care. And then also the kid who gets beat up every day by bullies also has a gun. He's never had this power before. What happens when people who are fed up 
get this power. I misjudged the old couple. I mean, they might be sadistic, but poor Franz Bonaparte, the, he's the innkeeper and he's been so nice to everybody. He even encouraged Wim to be a good child and Wim had the gun and he didn't kill anybody, but some outsider shot a cop, took a gun, killed everybody in the bar. Good old Roberto's already in town, of course, wreaking havoc. He's probably the one that's been starting all of this before Johan gets there and fulfills his master plan. We've got Tenma on the way. Nina agrees to go with Gillen as as well but they can't take a gun so i don't know how that's gonna work out no backup is coming because of the storm the whole goal here i'm assuming is just to kill anybody that has ever been in contact or can trace back johan but they also say he's trying to commit the perfect suicide so i don't know if he's going to end his own life as well but i think lung feels like tenma's trying to end everybody who has connection that can draw him back to tenma which is not the case it's Johan. Such an emotional scene with Grimmer just screaming his heart out at Bonaparte, who literally just says, I'm not afraid to die, but I don't know how to atone for my sins. I'm prepared to accept whatever fate has dealt to me. You literally set out to do one of the most sadistic plans ever, remove children's emotions from them, their sense of morals and ethics, and you're like, eh. I'll accept whatever punishment, not a big deal. <laughs> Tenma and Lung are face to face right now. I swear if Lung does not put two and two together, I'm going to freak out. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I freaked out for no reason. Lung apologized to Tenma. Hey, very noble of him. That's honestly, you gotta let your pride down because he, he has been lying to himself for about 10 to 15 years now. So good on him to finally realize and hopefully they can work together and get rid of Johan because Lung is a good agent to be fair, just not with this case. Please don't kill Grimmer, please. The final episode of The Magnificent Steiner, his favorite show as a kid, he doesn't remember the final episode and he says he essentially becomes an alternate personality because of those experiments conducted, which is The Magnificent Steiner. I don't know why I'm so attached to Grimmer, but I love him and I do not have a good feeling about this. I had a feeling he was gonna go out in a blaze of glory, but I really liked his arc. He found his emotions, he realized that he had emotions and he truly cared about his son and his wife and everybody around him. It's just a product of his environment and he finally turned it around just in time for him to pass away. So this letter that Lung found by Bonaparte essentially said that he fell in love with the twin's mother. Essentially, he just admitted to killing everyone that knew about the experiments in order to essentially protect the twins and their mother. I'm assuming so nobody would ever come back for them. So I guess he was trying to do the right thing in a way. But at the same time, he was the leader of it. So I can't feel that bad for him. Roberto this whole time was Grimmer's friend in Kinderheim, the one that loved hot cocoa. This is just showing somebody can experience the same trauma, experience the same exact things in their life and how they can both go down different paths. Wasn't Bonaparte's whole plan to create monsters essentially from childbirth and essentially lead a new regime to be this extremist group and take over? And now we're supposed to feel guilty for him because he realizes that he created a monster? He was doing this for so long. And I'm not sure if he's referring to the fact that he created a monster when he went back to visit them while they were sleeping. Either way, this was his whole plan from the beginning. And now he's just living with regret. It's like, dude, don't you think you would have realized this sooner if you had any conscious that what you were doing at Kinderheim was bad? What you were doing with these books, the reading group was bad? I'm literally stopping and talking about every single page at this point. But Roberto, or I guess we can call him Reinhardt, essentially has given us Johan's plan, which he said he's supposed to survive to the very end, the only one left, and die alone nameless. That's Johan's plan. Dr. Tenma will be allowed to see what Johan saw. Johan meets Tenma and Bonaparte, Pape, whatever you want to call him, in the streets. And what I'm gathering here is that Bonaparte pushed him over and Johan at the same time, I guess, trying to end it all. But honestly, I don't want Johan to die right now. I really need to know like what has been going through his mind this whole time. If we die without knowing anything, ah, I feel like it's just going to be frustrating for everybody in the story as well. Wim's dad comes and kills Johan. While it's not something that I'm super happy about because I'd like to get more insights, honestly, I think Wim needed that. Johan was threatening to 
to kill Wim so Tenma would shoot him. This whole time, everybody's like, Tenma, you don't need to go down this path. You don't need to become a murderer. You are a good person. And his dad saves his son. And it's honestly so nice and refreshing, I'm sure, because his entire life, his dad has been drunk and abusive towards Wim. And he finally does one good thing. And that one good thing changes everything. So even with all of what has happened, Tenma might go and save Johan once again. And it's honestly heartbreaking to see Wim crying over his dad who might get arrested for murder just for protecting his son. I feel so bad for both of them. That honestly is like the one thing that could have brought them together for the rest of their lives. Now it's going to ruin their lives. And we've got Tenma over here saving Johan not once, but a second time. It's hard to wrap my head around it. Like I understand the whole theme of this story, giving people a second chance, giving people a chance in general, forgiving them for their mistakes, no matter how bad, and giving them the chance to be the good person that they are inside is the most important thing. But at the same time, like look at all the death and destruction that has been caused. Lung and Grimmer never got to have their beer together. <sighs> so much emotions right now like I can't even think it's nice to see that Long is taking a step back from being so hyper focused on the thing that's been destroying his life for the past 15 years and is focusing more on what is good in life this might be the icing on the cake the, the funniest thing I've ever seen <laughs> literally please issue a formal apology to Dr. Tenma oh are bad for thinking that you were a serial killer for the past 15 years. Will you, will you just, uh, just a, just a, I'm sorry, is that good enough for you? Oh, Tenma found the twin's mother in southern France, somehow tracked her down, and she's about to reveal the names. Okay, I have just finished all nine volumes. I'd like to give a reaction before I look anything up. I'm sure I've misinterpreted a lot. I'm sure I've missed a lot. But first thing I can say is Urasawa just went above and beyond with this manga. The writing is some of the best I've seen seen in anything, let alone manga in novels, in screenplays, like it is insane. The amount of detail that he put into this manga from the history background, the serial killer psychoanalysis background, the trauma aspect from children and how they can grow up to be a product of their environment, how childhood trauma relates, the war and the history with East and West Germany. Like honestly, he could have taught a class in each of these subjects with the amount of research that he put in. Like I said, some of the best writing, some of the best attention to detail, a slow burning manga with a payoff that I can see a lot of people not necessarily loving. But the thing of it is, is it's a payoff that is real, not necessarily to the magnitude of the whole village and everything like that. But with Johan, with Tenma, with Nina, with all of these characters, that's how real life works. We don't necessarily always get happy endings but we do get endings that we can be content with. Johan admitting at the end that his mother was actually the one that gave away one of the twins. One of them didn't get dragged away. She willingly gave one up. And to this day, he doesn't know if she confused Nina with him and meant to give Johan up. I don't like to be the person that just like, wow, this is a great manga. It's gotten great reviews in the past and everybody loves it. So this is just automatically good. But quite honestly, like it's, it's incredible. In my collection, from what I have read so far, this is by far the best writing, not necessarily art or anything like that, but by far the best writing that I have come across in manga. So I will give Urasawa that. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And honestly, this just makes me want to read more of his works. But nonetheless, like incredible manga. There's really nothing else I can say. I hope that you enjoyed this 25 hour reaction. I don't even know how long this video is going to be. If you made it to the end, I appreciate you with my entire heart for watching all of this and my incoherent rambling. If you read Monster, let me know your thoughts in the comments on any of the volumes, whatever volume that you're up to. So I'm currently in editing mode, wrapping up this video. One, I apologize for how long it is. I didn't anticipate a reaction video being two hours, but honestly, there are about 3,600 plus pages to kind of take in and give what I thought was relevant. I literally cut out an hour of footage as well. I tried to make it semi-concise, but there were a few things that I wanted to talk about after I've already taken in everything from the manga, after I read about it a little bit more and just really looked into it. It's been a couple of days since 
since I finished it. The one thing that I did realize after reading it, after taking it in, was that Tenma was chosen and Johan was constantly after him because in his eyes, Tenma was the purest of pure souls on this earth. He saved a serial killer not once but twice. So if Johan could prove through his nihilistic worldview that he can turn Tenma into a bad person, then truly anybody could become a bad person. So it makes sense why he was so hard focused on Tenma the entire time. And there was something I was a little bit confused about while reading was I thought that Johan had taken in all of Nina's trauma from both Red Rose Mansion and 511 Kinderheim, but I kind of got it mixed up. It was Nina that went to Red Rose and then Johan that later went to 511 Kinderheim. So both twins experienced trauma and I can obviously see where he was corrupted from, but it's also interesting to see the dynamic that one twin has went through something pretty bad and still ended up a good person where the other just took on this worldview that everything is bad in the world and nothing matters. And honestly, I, I referred to Johan as having sociopathic tendencies in this manga, but I don't think he's as much of a sociopath as he's a product of his upbringing when he experienced a lot of death, a lot of psychological trauma, and was fed nihilistic worldviews through children's books, through Bonaparte, through anyone that he really came in contact with, especially at 5'11". In that regard, I can understand. And it's great to see that Urasawa showed moments with characters characters or they could have become essentially the the monster which is just the metaphor and they didn't they didn't allow themselves to get corrupt and go down the wrong path like Grimmer for example he went to 511 Kinderheim still redeemed himself Dieter experienced some pretty tragic things in his life as well and honestly even Ava Ava had a pretty tough run of it for a while and it was nice to see that she became an interior decorator i thought on that a little bit more and i was like why is she an interior designer decorator whatever it is that's the profession that she chose she's been so materialistic this whole time but it seems as though she's really taken in all of her life experiences and decided to give back in a sense to people rather than be so self-centered and one thing that i did notice was that there was a weird component where shuwald the rich billionaire had people read to him every single day because he enjoyed it and could no longer read since he was blind. But it also Bonaparte did the same thing. He had a reading group where people would read to him. There's so much. I feel like I can go on and on about this manga. There's just so much packed into it. At the end where Tenma sees Johan, we're not sure if he really sees him, if it's a dream, whatever it is, but Johan recounts that memory of his mother giving him up to the officers where he ends up going to 511 Kinderheim. It can honestly be interpreted in a lot of ways and I was thinking, did she give up Johan purposely because she knew he was corrupted already? Did she mean to give up Nina because she may have known that she was already at the Red Rose Mansion and she just thought it was too late for her honestly it's something to think on and when we talk about the monster everybody is always like johan's the monster clearly johan is the monster there are other elements where other people are the monster roberto for example and a lot of times where people could become the monster his mother could be the monster the people at 511 kinderheim that taught him all of these things could be the monster there's such a chain effect that you can just travel backwards in time and pinpoint on someone but the thing of it is is that person was affected by somebody else's actions. So where does the monster begin and where does it end? The only way to make it end is to break that cycle, essentially like Nina did. And that's it. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I'll try to cut these down to a more digestible size next time, but I'll see you next time.